Hello again, everyone. Thank you for joining us. As I said, I'm Lynn Doyle, and our topic this hour is coping after suicide. While there are about 30,000 suicides each year, do you know that there are nearly 5 million people in this country who are mourning the victims of those suicides? And each one of them will tell you that it's a painful loss that is indescribable, its effect far-reaching, and its impact lifelong. My first two guests can sadly attest to this. Donna Vusekic, watched in horror as her husband put a gun in his mouth and fired. The terror of that moment three years ago is as vibrant today as it was then. Carl E. David's loss was back in 1973 when his older brother Bruce hung himself in the family business. His death influenced Carl's entire life and he recently reflected on how huge an impact it's had in a new book called Bader Field, How My Family Survived Suicide. Donna, Carl, thank you so much for agreeing to talk about these tragic events in your personal lives in an effort to help others. I appreciate it very much. Thank, thank you, you for, for having us. us. Donna, when I heard your story, I was so moved because not only did you experience the loss of your husband, but you watched it happen. And you say the terror of that moment lives on in your mind and your heart even today. It does. It's something that I cannot even express the feelings that I had and th the moment that it was over and not knowing what to do or where to go and then the fear that rushes into your head to a point where you wonder okay how am I going to tell my kids how what am I supposed to do? call 911 I tried to give them CPR you know I tried to to try to bring them back because I do have EMT training but I knew pretty much from the beginning there was nothing that I could do. Did you have any idea that he was contemplating this or would consider such a drastic traumatic act? I never thought that he would do something like that at all and when he when he pulled out the gun I kept thinking to myself well this is just him you know he's gonna he's angry he's upset about something he got hurt at work and that he was going to you know just use it to scare me mm -hmm. you know but I had gotten a call at work he had called me and we talked all the time but I could tell something in his voice so I left work right away and went straight home and did you have him. a premonition of sorts that something was different that this um, pain that he was expressing to you was different than than previously absolutely I could feel it and it's you know, it's something like when you feel with your children or you feel with your spouse. And we were married for over 20 years. So I knew everything about him. I knew, you know, his voice, his tones. But so you didn't know that he would take his own life. I had no idea that he would do this. And while it's been three years and every day you are dealing with this, does it ever get any easier? It gets easier to get past that actual moment because it does fade but every time I look at my sons I think about the pain that they went through and continue to go through yes and how I can't take that away as a parent and they have to live with that absolutely as much as their father may have loved them or they loved him they still have to live with the loss and the fact that he made that decision that That's, makes it tougher doesn't it it does the hardest thing is that he chose to leave you know, I'm going to fight for every moment that I can be here with my son. Right. But he chose to leave. And anger is a big part of where I'm at right now. And we're going to talk about that later in the show. In fact, if you have experienced this and have advice or words of comfort or your experience that you think could help other people, we are going to ask you uh, to tell us about it later on in the show. Plus, we'll have some experts here with us to help you if you're experiencing some of the things that our guests here are as well. Anger is something that uh, they say, Carl, you know, comes uh, at a certain point uh, as you are recovering. You've experienced since 1973 a myriad of of emotions, I imagine anger being one of them. Absolutely. Anger was, after shock, the first reaction. Sadness, it's all mixed together. I think that anger and sadness are fairly much um, the same sides, opposite sides of the same coin. And anger is just, you get enraged and you feel as if you've been abandoned and you're just kind of left alone. You know, you're thinking it's a very selfish act that, that someone has done, 
not to themselves, but to your family. I mean, w when they take their life, they don't die alone. They take their family with them. You know, I think that's a very compelling statement and one that we hope will stay in the minds of anyone who is depressed at this time or contemplating suicide because really the impact isn't just on them by taking their own lives. It's, it's on everyone who cares or loves them. It is. It surrounds a whole circle of people around these people. And I think that at the time they're in such a the state of despondence that they don't really see beyond that and their pain is overwhelming and they can't really see that they're going to do something that will affect everyone around them, people who love them. And I think they fail to see that there are people around who love them. Your brother hung himself in the family business and it was your father who found him. And for years he couldn't return to that part of the building. Can you describe for us what your father told you, what that was like for him to find his son and a son who had ended his own life? Well, at first he didn't really talk about it. He was just numb from the pain. And it took, as you say, a long time for him to be able to go back. Even to the gallery, it took a while. And I remember the first time he came in and I was there, he was wearing sunglasses and he was enraged. I mean, he slammed the door. You could hear it throughout the whole building. And it just took a long time, even before the smile would come back. You sometimes even feel guilty smiling after a situation like that, don't you? I mean, it's it's just it's it's hard for you to enjoy life because you feel like you're somehow being disrespectful to the person who left. And a lot of it too is seeing the world go on. You're still in this grieving state, and you're watching people cut their lawn, go to the grocery store, and continue on with their life, and you're still in this whole bubble of hurt. And after someone leaves or after they die, a lot of times you'll have people that stay with you. I had people there for three or four weeks. But then after that time period is over and you're all alone, it's a whole new ball game. And people think that you should be moving on. Right. Where for you, you have this image in your head of, of what your husband did. You, it was 1973, and I can see that it still moves you today in 2011. It does. It, you just don't, you can move on, but you don't forget it. It becomes a part of you. It's part of your soul. It's an imprint that you can't get over. You can only at best learn to live with it as best you can. So your parents were grieving the loss of a son. You and your brother were grieving the loss of, of a brother. Right. As a, as a family unit, were you able to help each other, or, or did this divide you? Well, we could have gone either way. We could have split, or we could have pulled together. We chose to pull together because we're a very close-knit family, and that was the only way we were going to be able to survive. So we did. But for many people, it really does divide a family and, and not by their own choice just because people don't know how to grieve they don't know how to mourn they don't know how to recover and we're going to talk to the therapist about that as well because that's why I'm trying to do this show and, and Carl I thank you for giving me the inspiration to do it by sending me your book because I really feel like people who are contemplating or have thought about suicide need to know for lack of a better word, the mess they leave behind. The pain just doesn't end, does it? No, because it they've will. ended their pain. Yes. You know, my son, he um, had tattoos done in honor of his father because my husband's last words were to tell my youngest son goodbye and that he loved him. So I had to, to tell my son that, you know. When I went to go tell him at the high school that his father had died, they it was just, an emotional, I couldn't do anything to stop the pain for him, you know. And, and as mothers, that's all we want to do is, is to keep our kids from feeling and any kind of pain. Absolutely, you know, and if I could have taken away any time, you know, and there's no easy way to say it. No, I know. My father died when I was young, but it was a natural act, and it was still one of the most uh, horrible things that someone had to tell me, yeah. and to know that a parent has done that or a brother has done that 
deliberately, even if they're not of the right mind at the time. It's, it's, just, it's just a horrific, horrific thing for people to have to go through. We do have to take a quick break, but when we come back, we're going to hear more from Donna and from Carl. But as I said, we're also going to be joined by some experts who are going to give us some insight into how you could deal if you've been faced with a horrific loss. And believe me, we're also going to give you some signs. If you are contemplating suicide or know someone who's showing suicidal tendencies, please stay with us. We're going to try to help you recognize those and prevent this from ever happening again. If you have questions or comments that we would invite you to uh, share those with us, you can write to me directly at lynn at lynndoyle.net. If you do have a question or a comment, we will pass those along to each of the guests and hopefully they'll be able to respond to you. I want to bring in our experts now because we do want this show to be meaningful and we want to give you some answers to some questions that you might have. And for that, we brought in two of the best. Joanne Hoffman is a professor emeritus at Rutgers University. She's been a volunteer trained listening specialist with content of Mercer County, New Jersey for 28 years. During that time, she's listened to men, women, and teens who wanted to live in their lives. She's currently the organization's director of training interns and apprentices. Also back with us, an old friend of the show, Ed Convoy. He's a staff therapist at the Council for Relationships over the years, has given us a lot of great advice. But I want to turn to Joanne first because, you know, I have personally been involved with contact of Mercer County for many, many years, and I admire the work that you all do. I can't imagine for 28 years listening to as many people as you have who wanted to end their life. How difficult is that? Very. It's very difficult um, because we do become involved with that person emotionally. We are listening to them and we're trying to do everything we can to get them into a safe place, to get them to stop at least for this hour or this day and to convince them that there is another thing, that there is a way out, but to just stop and think about it. And that's the, the hardest thing to do, to be compassionate and empathetic and non-judgmental and hold on. Does your experience and research indicate that it's usually a split-second decision when someone takes his or her own life, or is it as a result of, of a long process? A little bit of both. Most of the people that we talk to, when they start, they've been depressed or they're suffering grief or there's been a problem in their life, there's a loss, and so they're constantly worrying this. And it's like a wound and you keep scratching at it and so it gets worse and worse and worse. But then there's got to be one point at one time where they say, okay, this is it, I can't do it anymore, I want out. And when they call us, this is, they're calling for that help to stop. Thank God something like contact is there for yeah. people to reach out to. But Ed, if they don't know it, you know, what else can we offer to these people if they don't know that there's a national hotline or a local group like contact? How can we as, as friends and loved ones help? Well, that's part of our responsibility as part of that larger network to have that information available. And as Carl was talking about, to be able to talk about this with, with young people, with elderly folks, to bring this out in the open so it's not as the secrecy is gone and the stigma is removed, to really begin to, to make it more public. And this is why this is really great to have books like this and conversations like this, because so often it's one of those unspeakables. Well, it is. It's unspeakable. And it's even difficult for those who hear about it because you don't know what to say to the person who's, who's lost a loved one to a, a suicide completion. It's very difficult when you're on the outside. It really is, and, and the whole grieving process is so much more complicated because in these cases, unlike a homicide where there's a clear victim, here the victim is the perpetrator. And that makes this whole, the whole way that we grieve about it very complicated, and there's a way to begin to work through that with some professional help and with some other really wonderful supportive programs out there. I have to ask this question because, you know, I'm sure people at home are wondering, all of us go through tough times. I mean, there's not a soul who's watching this show or sitting at this desk or in this studio anywhere that hasn't had something bad happen to them. They've lost a loved one, they lost a job, you know, maybe they got arrested. I mean, not everyone considers or completes a suicide. So why is it that some people are more vulnerable to it and how do we know who those people are? I mean, Donna said she was taken kind of by surprise by this. In your book, you say you didn't have any indication your brother would do this. How do we know that someone that we love is not thinking about it? Well, there are some signs that as we continue to study suicide that we look at, um, people, their 
whole attitude changes. If they were sort of a messy person, all of a sudden they get really, really clean. Their appetite changes, or maybe their attitudes change. Things change, and most people see the changes, but they're afraid to say, you know, you've been talking funny, you've been organizing things or disorganizing. I have to ask, are you thinking of killing yourself? Oh my gosh, what if you ask that and the person looks at you and says, are you crazy? I mean, oh, that's good. you may offend them forever. True, but they'll still be there. But if it's not, if they actually are thinking about it, they'll say, oh, thank God somebody saw that. I need to talk about it. And that's the beginning. And it is OK to talk about it. We it's, don't have oh, to go to a therapist. We can just talk amongst talk, ourselves. We can talk amongst ourselves, but we can also tell people, look, there are other places. You know, I'm, an, I'm a trained listener, but there are therapists. There are people to help you as well as somebody who just listen. Our topic this hour is coping after suicide, and sadly, we are nearly out of time, but we do want to give you the opportunity to ask questions or to share your experiences with us, so you can do that at my um, email address at the bottom of the screen, and then I will pass that along to each of the guests, and they'll be able to respond to you, hopefully, to your satisfaction. I, I do want to make the point that um, we have to be very per particularly careful when it comes to our children because I have done on this show so many times the kids that were bullied or the kids that got a bad grade or the kids that felt like, oh, nobody loved me, my boyfriend broke up with me, I'm going to kill myself. Is, is that an expression that we've just come to, to accept in the society? And should people be using it, Carl, so freely? I don't think they should be using it so freely. And I think that uh, when you hear it, your, your ears should go up and your guard should be up and see if there's any merit to it. And, and I think at that point, you have to explain to your children that no matter what happens, it's not the end of the world. Suicide is never, ever the answer. It's not the solution. It's a permanent solution to a temporary problem. Right. So I think that's something that's thrown around too much today, randomly. Yes. And you have to have that one-on-one -on -one with your children because it happened in your family? Well, we did. We sat down with them and explained what happened with my brother because at a certain point in time, you, you need to, almost as an insurance policy, just to let them know that this happened and how it devastates a family and that it's not the answer. And Donna, you know that as well. And I would imagine as a mother that you're now so much more protective, not that you weren't before with your sons, but certainly now. No, nothing's going to happen to my sons, it, if I have anything to say about it. But the hardest thing is just looking forward and seeing, OK, grandbabies and, mm -hmm. and marriages. And if someone is thinking about doing this, you've got to get past the point you're at right now and realize what you're going to miss and how that person is going to miss you at that time in their life. Can a family or an individual who's lost someone move on? I mean, you know, Carl's yes, put his yeah. thoughts into writing yeah. and, and Donna's here talking about it and trying to be an advocate for other survivors of suicide. Yeah. Can, we, can we survive it? Yes, we can and we do. And that's part of the, the courageous uh, experiences I see. and. Of families who do move on. It's difficult because there's a sense of leaving someone behind. It never ends. But Is yes, there also we can. a sense of blame that you must have done something well, that's to, the you other know, side to of it, cause this? That, that we have to be cautious about because sometimes we can see these, all of these signs in hindsight. It's a lot of what ifs. And we really have to work through, through this with families and parents and kids to say, it's really easy to see these things and connect those dots afterwards. But often, some of those things that are normal rebellious behavior with teenagers or normal transitional aspects of our lives, then later we can see, oh, that was a sign. So we have to be careful about that layer of guilt, okay. saying, oh, I should have seen it, when sometimes we can't. So those signs that we told you about, really pay close attention to those. Now, Joanne, what I would like you to do is look right into this camera and tell anyone who might be contemplating taking his or her own life something to, to motivate them to stay with us until this pain passes. Talk to somebody. Call somebody a neighbor, a friend, a family member, anybody, anybody that you have contact with, talk to somebody or call a crisis line, talk to a minister, talk to a rabbi, but start to communicate how you're feeling because that will help you feel less bad. It will help you to to, to maybe to start to see what the, why the reasons are for living as well as the reasons for dying, but talk. If you had a second to, to say to your brother what this has done to your family that may have changed it, like if you had that five seconds beforehand, what would you say to him? Just don't do it. 
we all love you, and whatever's on your mind is fixable. Okay, and how about you? Think of your sons, mm. and think about how it's gonna affect them for the rest of their lives. Just give it two seconds and think, look forward to their future. Just hold on one more second. Mm -hmm. I cannot tell you how grateful I am that all of you appeared with us today. And, and Carl, again, thank you very much. My condolences on the loss thank of you. your brother and, of course, on the loss of your husband. If you need help, please, please, please get it, everyone. Thank you so much. In the time it takes for you to watch this television show, someone somewhere in America will have taken his own life. Every 16 minutes, someone commits suicide. Most likely to kill themselves? Men between 24 and 65 or older. Teens who make a split-second life-altering decision and people who suffer from depression or substance abuse. These are leading causes for suicide. For those who kill themselves, they may think the pain is over, but for the millions of family members, loved ones, friends, and co-workers they leave behind, the pain is just beginning.